So the current fan theory is that Captain America didn't have the ability to lift the hammer of Thor, Mjolnir, because he was unworthy beforehand, because he was still it was still weighing on his heart the fact that he knew that Bucky had killed Tony's parents. And then once he was able to get that and then get through and kind of like forgive and forget with Tony and that relationship was able to come back together and heal, now he was back to being God's righteous man and he was able to lift a hammer. And that's how we have the Captain America of today. I just don't care. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, everybody, welcome to Back to Basics, a uh, podcast where Jason and I, so we are uh, EMS professionals, so I'm an emergency physician, Chris, and Jason is a, a paramedic, firefighter, RN, and we take uh, what are sometimes complicated medical topics and we kind of break them down and make them a little more easy to understand and bring them back to basics. See what we did there? So today um, we are going to talk about a topic that can be intimidating and a lot of times seemingly complicated and we're going to do just that we're going to break it down we're going to take it back to basics and we're going to hopefully simplify it and give you an approach that uh, makes you feel more confident Uh, so give us 45 minutes and you will be the most competent in talk about making babies nope that's not the topic it's but so i pray pray for that's not what i said i have the the dummy and everything you probably okay that's no nope Nope. No, I'm Delivering just babies. <laughs> All right. Today's topic is delivery, and it's titled Delivery. Try not to drop it, because that's rule number one right there. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. probably shut the podcast off right now. You know what you need there to know. There you go. We just simplified it, took it back Got to it. basics. Done. Um, no, so today we're talking about delivery, and to kind of introduce this topic, I want to talk a little bit about the stigma around delivery. Mm-hmm. I'll share a personal experience. I delivered a baby, uh, it was a couple months ago now, like two months ago. And I was the least experienced on my entire crew. All the guys had, had been there longer than me on the department. And the baby was about to, it was crowning. And I was like, all right, it's crowning. And everybody stepped away. And I was just alone in the ambulance and had to deliver the baby because no one wanted to do it. So do it. even the most experienced medics mm-hmm. sometimes don't. I was then called the baby whisperer for a short period of time. That's cool. All I did was deliver the baby. Like, it was not hard. It's mm-hmm. not a difficult thing to do. Mm-hmm. But for some reason... We get this mindset that it's this big, scary, rare event thing that like we got to worry about because there's all these things. You know, it's just not that. It's really not that big of a deal. It's yeah. probably one of the easiest calls. That's messy, but it's one of the easiest calls you'll ever do. Sure, it, it is. I think easier this, than treating chest pain. I think the stigma around the delivery of babies comes from the fact that we are emergency providers, and when we're taught about it, we're taught about all the terrible, horrible things that can go wrong. Yes. So we just assume that that's. What's going to happen? That must be why time. they called us. It's a it's an emergency, right? Yeah, which which will you'll find is not the case. And hopefully, what we can do today is give you a very clear cut uh, set of guidelines and, and a process to follow uh, to mitigate any complications and to, like I said, make sure that things go as smoothly as they're supposed to go. So. And something to remember is that babies were being delivered well before EMS was, mm-hmm. like probably easily at least ten years, probably longer. Yep, at least ten, but but I'm not wrong. But you're not wrong. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're not so wrong. No, really, this is a natural life occurrence. This is a big life event, which is something we'll talk a little bit about. But uh, it's it's dramatic, I think, for us because we're it, it's rare um, that someone calls nine one one because they're giving birth. But it is a very basic basic treatment that we do. Basic, I wouldn't even call it treatment. We're not mm-hmm. treating a disease, right? A baby's right. not a disease. It's a wonderful thing. Well, we've said before in other process, or other podcasts that like our job in EMS. If you and you, if you can have this mindset, I think it really changes how you practice for the better. Is that our job is to help and support the body in taking care of illness and trauma because the body does it itself so same with delivery right like mothers were delivering babies at least 10 years before ems ever yeah. on the scene before physicians i mean like even now in different parts of the world women go out into the forest and deliver their baby and come back themselves like like we are there not to we don't deliver a baby right it's actually kind of a like a misconception to even say that like I delivered a baby. Yeah. Like, no, you, no, you did it. The you, you just the made mom sure did that. <laughs> right. Yeah. The mom did that. Yeah. So exactly. So like I said, we are there to support and guide and help, you know, help the process. Um, and which a lot of times that process was meant to go about without any help. So we probably don't have to do that much a lot of times. Yeah. So what's the first thing we want to talk about here is, um, we say a little bit about the stigma. Cause like I said, this is not something that, uh, 
we have to be afraid of. This is not something that we need to be worried or intimidated by. There's really um, only a few pathways that we head down to. We're basically going to progress. We'll explain to you what a normal delivery process is. And we're either going to progress down that process, and then when there's interruptions, there's just a couple little things that we can do to try to adjust and, and fix things if there is a complication. Mm -hmm. And if we can't adjust and fix those things or we recognize something, then we're just going to honestly work to try to prevent delivery, and we're going to haul butt to the hospital. Like, like right. Those are kind of – it's just a few little things that we do. But a lot of confusion. You know, another thing that I see all the time is confusion between what a neutral cord is versus a prolapse cord because one's kind of scary and one's not that big of a deal and lots of things like that. What is breach present? Presentation versus, you know, armor limb presentation and, and how does that work? So mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we're going to give you some visual examples. No. <laughs> no we're we're going to talk a little bit about that and, uh, and, and make it easy. So we'll start with just what things do we apply? What is the basic evaluation that we do? on every mother every time whether they're giving birth or not but we know they're pregnant and there's like what are we going to do every single time i like to always start with like here's my toolbox this is what mm -hmm. we're going to do right so we always are going to start with evaluating the abcs of the mom mm -hmm. right evaluate and, the mother and i'll say that that's one of the big things keep in mind is that the best thing you can do for the baby is take care of mom mm -hmm. right taking care of mom's oxygenation, ventilation, breathing, circulation, all that stuff. That is the best and the most appropriate way to take care of the infant. Like we talk about like you have two patients. We say that a lot of times. Well, you have two patients. And I was like, yes and no, right? Because, you know, one needs to be prioritized so that the other can actually live, right? So like I yeah. said, like keep that in mind. Like I said, treat the mother because that's going to be the best, you know, way to treat the infant or the, the well, and fetus. Once baby's born, don't, don't get tunnel vision on that baby now. Like mother still, there, there's yeah, postpartum yeah. hemorrhage things that can go on. You know, there's issues with, with the mother that mm -hmm. can. You still need to be evaluating the mother, right? They're easy yeah. treatments, but th we need to pay attention to the mother yeah, and yeah. not get too focused. Because I've seen that before. You know, you get super focused in, on the baby now because it's like, oh my gosh, I got two patients, so I gotta, I gotta figure this one out. Right, but right. Just a couple little things we do. So, ABCs of the mom first. Vitals of the mom, including a sugar. Sugar is important. Uh, during the delivery process and like the, the, you can have kind of wonky sugar issues during that. So something to pay attention to. And then you always want to ask a number of questions. So we're going to go through them one by one. This is just helps the hospital be prepared. It helps you be prepared in case you've got to, you know, get some other supplies ready. It lets the hospital know what's going on with the overall treatment of the mother and the baby and what they need to prepare. Like that's, that's our job, right? Preparing the hospital for what they're going to do. So we want to ask when is the mother's due date? Or when was her last period? Okay. You don't have to do the math. Just write the date down and just pass it on. Let them do the math at the hospital. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't have to figure that out. Just when when is your expected due date? If they don't know that, okay, when was the last time that you had a, you had your period? So then we can kind of count back. Mm -hmm. Well, that does help you kind of prioritize. This is a first trimester, second trimester, or third trimester right, If they're like a fetus. month ago, like, okay, well, I don't think I'm worried about delivery right now. Right, yeah, yeah. But if they're like, oh, my due date's in four weeks like okay well this could be a preterm type of situation yeah. if they're giving yeah so it kind of just puts them in a general category of what right what are we dealing with um you want to ask if they've had any prenatal care before so th this helps you know that the baby's been evaluated already you know through ultrasound they've they've looked at positions a lot of times with ob guys can tell you hey, we've got, this is going to most likely be a breach presentation. Mm -hmm. This is mo already most likely going to be a complicated birth because there's multiple kids in there or whatever, yeah, right? Yeah. So prenatal care is important for that. It's not just to get the vitamin, you know, some of the essential vitamins that you need to protect yourself from, from certain things in pregnancy, but also to to give the providers a heads up of how the birth, how the birth could take place right. or how it could go. And for an example, so like I said, my son, my oldest was breached the entire time. Like he never rotated or flipped. Yeah. So we had, we knew we had to do a C-section. So like not having prenatal care. So, so when the question is that, yes, they've had prenatal care. That's a, that's a good sign. You know, that things that they should be aware of any complications that um, would be expected, you know, if there, if there were like, so for instance, like, you know, my son's mother, if he, if she, if she had been asked by EMS, like, Hey, have you had prenatal care? Yes. Like, you know, ha is there any complications? She would have said, Oh yeah, he's breached. His head's up here. That yeah. kind of thing that you would know that if someone hasn't had prenatal care, that does just, you know, kind of like put it in your mind that, that we don't really know. And sometimes that can be a little bit of an indication that you, there's more of a chance for complications because we just don't have 
the data yeah. that we normally would sort of thing. Right. And the reasoning behind the not getting prenatal care, is that because um, that that patient, the mother, is, you know, are, are they impoverished or something like that? Like, mm-hmm. and, and that and those types of things can lead to other situations where the baby can be unhealthy, too. So yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we want to look into that, you know? or something like that. And, and again, it's not your job to make judgments or, like, figure that out, but it's just a good thing to know. It shouldn't right. raise your anxiety that there hasn't been prenatal care, but it should raise your awareness that, hey, I might be might be seeing some things that right. are different. I like that. Don't raise your, it shouldn't raise your anxiety. It should raise your awareness. Yeah. That's good. Put that on a T-shirt. Okay. <laughs> um, I want 10 cents on the dollar. All right, deal. Why did I just negotiate only 10%? I don't know. That was great. I'll take it. You said it. Everybody um, heard it. So Next thing you want to ask, well, this kind of went with it. Are there expected complications, right? Like, is yeah. your baby breach, right? Um, you want to ask, is there is a history of a miscarriage? This can be kind of a challenging question to ask sometimes because it, it is personal and, and that can be tough. But you need to be direct. Ask if there's a history of a miscarriage. Um, there's also some stigma around miscarriage, too. I mean, this is a very, very real part. I mean, like... A lot of women have miscarriages and multiple ones a lot of times. So, like I said, I would almost argue don't hesitate. Be like, hey, have you any? Like, yeah. Women are very upfront about that. There's no, like, I think sometimes we try to, like, tread lightly around miscarriages, which yeah, obviously they can be. It can be a very can emotional, be difficult experience and emotional, but they are a very real part of life that happens. So, yeah. I think, yeah, you know, asking that question is very important because you, you want to know not only have they had miscarriages, but, like, when? Was it early in the pregnancy? Was it in the first month or so? Was it later in pregnancy? You know, I mean, that, that kind of thing, because those can kind of clue you in to see if there might be complications with this one. Right. Um, and then how fast did they come last time? So babies tend to get faster and faster. Nine months. They get cranked out of there. Eight months, seven months, no, six months. No, not what we're talking about. No? I oh. mean, like the delivery process. Oh, the delivery process. <laughs> right. Okay. So, right, like your your first baby might be delivered in, it might take hours and hours and hours or a full day, right? Mm-hmm. Other, you know, subsequent deliveries will usually tend to be, I, I've heard from an OB guy, tend to be 50% faster than the previous one. Hmm. I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't know if that was just like a fluke in his. That could be. Delivery yeah. I don't know, but they yeah they can be up to, like cranking them out pretty quick, right? So they might be like, oh no, I'm fine. I just went into labor like last time. It was it was a day that baby might be coming a lot faster though. Yeah. So just something be prepared for that. If they came last time and they're like, oh yeah, it was an explosive delivery and he came in like ten seconds, you better expect that that's probably going to happen again. Right. Yeah. Um, and the thing is too is is keep in mind if it if it's a well I guess the next question kind of goes with like. The para versus, you know, gravida. gravida. So, like, how many times have you been pregnant and how many, like, actual deliveries and births have you had? So, if it's the first baby that they've ever delivered, it's 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 most likely, 90-some percent of the time, going to be a slower process. You're going to have yeah. time. You're going to yeah, have time. maybe hours and things like that. If they've had seven kids, then expect this one's probably going to come quickly, yes. right? So. Yeah. So, yeah, that is the question. We, we refer to it in EMS as para and gravida, para versus gravida. People get mixed up with this. We, we want to give them like a para gravida score. So when you're calling the hospital, I can be like, she's para three, gravida four. Mm-hmm. All right. That doesn't make sense. Yes, it does. That one does? Yes. And that's what confuses people. Oh, even, you guys, yeah. Because we switch it in. It could be side. gravida, we para. G, G2, P3 or, or something like that. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, you want to define it. And this is, it confuses a lot of people. How I was, I was reminded of. Of the, or I was told this when I was an EMS student by a fellow EMS student. And I've never forgotten it. And it's G gravida is got knocked up. How many times they got knocked up? Okay. Or P para, how many times did they push the baby out? Okay. Kind of insensitive, but uh, I mean, it works. I could say got pregnant. I don't know. That would be better. But, <laughs> but got knocked up. Well, and I, I don't know. She's the one who told it to me. I, okay. It was it's not, it's not mine. All right. Gravida good. got knocked up. P pushed the baby out. So. Let's go with got pregnant. Got Let's, pregnant. That's okay, fine. Right. Got pregnant. <laughs> if you, well, so but then you have the word pregnant in it and p para pregnant. It confuses mm, you. Got okay. knocked up. I, Push the baby. Out. We'll figure it out. Got anyway, inseminated. don't make a t-shirt yet. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but so there are instances where you can have a gravida number, a got pregnant number that is higher than or that is lower than the amount of babies that come out of you. How is that possible? I don't know. You have them. Huh? You have two little girls and they're identical. Oh, twins. You can have twins, right? Yeah. So you can be. Oh, I didn't even think right. about yeah, that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Your wife is literally gravita one, para two. She only got knocked up once. And she, she pushed two, two babies, babies out, out. right? So this is what people get confused. That's what people want to jump in and be like, that's impossible. It's the mm-hmm, riddle. Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> But it's not impossible. 
but also don't mess up and make it sound like someone had twins when they didn't because right. you don't know the numbers, right? right? So got pregnant, pushed the baby out. And this is important because it tells us this includes number of miscarriages. So this kind of right. goes along with that question, right? Well, I've got I've been pregnant, you know, seven times, but I've only given birth to four babies. Yeah, yeah. And then you want to... The follow-up question would be, okay, do you have any twins or tri- triplets, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. well, now I know how many miscarriages you've had or yeah, yeah. how many, um, you know, abortions you've had. So it's actually a, um, and not not relevant to EMS, but we actually break it down even more on like, like, like not even in, in emergency medicine, but like in the OBGYNs, it'll be like G2, P3, 5, 7, 9. Like it, it like breaks down each, like, and each one means like this, how okay. many spontaneous yeah. miscarriages that they had, how many abortions, how many live children. Like that's another thing too. Like if a, if a child was born, but then died, like that, but again, yeah. irrelevant a little bit for EMS, but just something to be aware of. So yeah. I'm so assuming that's Ravida, an acute phase, like was born and then died. Like within as a neonate is what you're saying? No, I don't even think necessarily. Like if you if your 35 year old son gets hit by a train, it affects your <laughs> affects your score. Yeah, I, I, I guess I don't know, <laughs> okay. but they're probably that's not asking like 70 year old women like what's yeah, your GP? I don't know. Okay, all right. So anyway, that's what you're gonna do every time. You're gonna ask those questions. Get the ABCs. Get the vitals. Ask these questions. Due date or last period? Prenatal care? Any expected complications? Is there a history of miscarriage? How fast did they come last time? And your para versus gravita score. Mm-hmm. All right. Gravita has got pregnant, and para is pushed a baby out. Yes. Cool. Um. Then you want to do the, so next after you've asked those questions and you've and you've covered your basic assessment, you do want to check for crowning every single time. Okay, if they're pregnant. And it's it that's what they called you for. It, it's a pregnancy thing. You're going to check for crowning, okay? Um, Unless they're like my last period was one month ago. Well, is there? So here's what I say: is I say check for crowning if contractions are present. Yeah. Or there if suspected catch, contractions are, pre- yeah, are present, perfect. right? Yeah. So contractions are something that happen during labor. Labor is not necessarily saying there's imminent delivery. Mm-hmm. Labor can can go for a long period of time. But if they're having contractions. You do need to check for crowning. Yep. And I have been the guy in the ambulance where I've said, okay, we need to check for crowning. I'm teching. I'm, I'm on the monitor. And I've had partners refuse. No, I'm not. I'm not doing that. That's I'm uncomfortable with doing that. What? And it's like, that's, that's not job. acceptable. Like, that's the job. You yeah, have to do that, job, right? right? So do not, don't be embarrassed about this. Don't be weird. Always have another person in the ambulance with you because yeah, yeah, you're, yeah. you know, it's, it's a sensitive area or whatever. Explain to the mother what's going on. I have to check for crowning in case your baby's coming very early. But understand something that, you know, babies can be born and survive at like 20 weeks. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like super, way earlier than you'd expect. Right. So th- it might be only a month into their pregnancy and they're having a miscarriage or they're, you know, having like a spontaneous abortion where they're they're giving birth to a child that won't make it. Either way, you have to you have to yeah, be around to deliver for, yeah. that, right? Yeah. So you have to be around for that. So check for crowning. You've got a story, an interesting one, that if you don't mind sharing, about not checking for crowning. I wouldn't name any people or anything like that. What do you but mean? Do you remember you had that one EMS crew that came in? Well, that wasn't crowning. They they had checked for crowning. So, oh, boy. Yeah. So I had a patient that was that came in for, uh, they, they, they said, it just said miscarriage. Typically, when we say miscarriage, like we assume that it, I don't know, we, maybe we shouldn't, but we assume it's like, you know, in the first couple weeks of pregnancy or mm-hmm. the first month or so. And um, so she was put in the, a back room, like a, not a back room, but you know what I mean? Like she was put in like one of the non-acute critical, rooms. Yeah. And it took us a little while to, to get to her in the queue of patients we had. And so I went in there and I said, oh, what happened? She's like, well, yeah, like, you know, I, I'm pregnant or I was pregnant and I, you know, I had a miscarriage. Said, oh, okay. And she was brought in by EMS. So, um, I was like, are you still having some bleeding? She's like, yeah, I'm still having some bleeding. I said, okay, well, let's do an exam. And and I go to do the exam, and there's a clamped cord. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I was like, wait a second. Did you – how far along were you? And she was like two or three months into her pregnancy. So I said, well, did did they deliver the fetus? And she was like, yeah. And they basically just – and they didn't tell anybody. They, 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 I don't think they delivered the fetus, but like, like, the, like the, yeah. she had like had this miscarriage, and it wasn't a viable pregnancy. But then they had clamped the cord and left it. She still has a placenta in there. She's still like that. Yeah, that's a lot. You need to. Geez. Yeah, like there's a lot of information that I would have liked to have had going into that room. Right. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I think for whatever reason, sometimes in EMS we've built the stigma around this stuff, right and down, yeah. yeah, well, just like you know, like I, I feel like it goes one of two ways, either. It's not taken serious enough, 
or people are so anxious about it that they don't necessarily sometimes do and not, i'm not i'm speaking well. in general terms here yeah. but like you know they they don't do what they should do or yeah i don't know it's, it's just kind it's of a rare thing right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. it was so interesting so. so we don't want things like that to happen right so always check for crowning always be communicating always provide the mother comfort and privacy uh, in the ambulance or on the scene. So something to understand is if there is signs of imminent delivery, meaning the baby's coming now, we don't start going to the hospital. We don't do that. We we set things up right there and we prepare to deliver the baby. If there's an expected complication that requires transport to the hospital, then we break those rules and some things can happen. But as as a general, you know, general rule, if the baby or if the mother is showing signs of imminent delivery, we're going to set up, we're going to deliver the baby right there. So you don't even have to do this in your ambulance. Sometimes I'll put them in the ambulance um, just because I've got all my tools there, you know, and I can kind of control that environment better. But I've, I've delivered babies or assisted in delivering hey, babies, hey, hey. Uh, you know, in living rooms and yeah. on on bedroom beds and all, all over the place. So um, I think, believe our father did it in the back of a, cat, a taxi cab one time mm-hmm. at the airport. Mm-hmm. And he was off duty because he's just a hero man. I don't yeah, know. He does this weird stuff. <laughs> so it can happen anywhere. Um so next, let's just talk about those signs of labor versus delivery and the big difference, right? Mm-hmm. Labor is just the sign is what? Labor is what? So labor is the the process of um, of the cervix dilating and the, you know, and, and, and the baby and moving into position to be delivered. To be delivered, right? right. So it goes so, through the cardinal movements. There's mm-hmm. lots of things that have to happen. And then, exactly then the right. baby kind of drops down. Right. And that's usually what the mother feels. Okay, now it's coming and I'm starting. To yeah, happen. exactly. But these contractions have to happen. You know, uterine tr- contractions have to happen in order to get the baby into that position in the first place. So contractions can be going on for a very long period of time. That doesn't necessarily mean mother's pushing with the contractions and forcing the baby out in your delivery. Right. So signs of labor are your water breaking and you're having contractions, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, well, the thing is, too, is that we're, there's three, technically, there's three stages of labor and delivery is you know, like the third is in the third stage of labor. So there's, there's like, well, like the labor itself can be much longer than the delivery process. Yeah. And again, signs of labor or, or a patient being in labor would again, be like their water breaks or their ha- They start to have contractions and their cervix is dilating. It's yeah. Just not the cervix the right started point. to dilate and thin out mm-hmm. to make room for the baby to be able to, to be able to be delivered. Yeah. So one thing that's funny to me is then usually like, you know, cervix is dilated to 10 centimeters, right? Mm-hmm. 10 centimeters. And, mother has an urge to push and stuff like that we're not measuring the cervix so we no. don't have a ruler in the back right. of the ambulance so here are the things that you need to know in the back of the ambulance of when delivery is imminent one she says the baby is coming right. if she thinks the baby is coming 100 percent that baby is coming right. right that is a sign of imminent delivery two she just pooped mm-hmm. if she feels like she has to poop or just pooped that's a sign of the baby's coming mm-hmm. there's a head in between her legs, because we should be checking for crowning, right? right, right. If you see crowning, the baby is coming. Right. And then we usually say contractions are two minutes apart and lasting for, is it over a minute? Uh, we usually about a minute. About two minutes apart, and they're lasting for about a minute, and that, that cervix is dilated. But we're not going right. to be able to check any of those things, right? So it's not necessarily like, oh my gosh, like you see on TV, I guess I just would get confused, right? On TV, like someone's like, my water broke, and they're like, oh, and they rush off to go to the hospital, they deliver the baby. And I, so I th- always thought that was like part of delivery. Right, yeah. Not really, no, it's part of labor, but right. it could have happened 24 hours prior. Right. You know what I mean? Some people, well, their water a- breaks, they wait for hours before they go to the hospital because they know the baby's not coming. Yeah, yeah. Well, like my wife with the twins, I think her water broke, and they just, we were, in, we happened to be in the hospital at the time, but we just, we, they waited until like the next yeah. morning. And then when she was, you know, able and ready, they, you know, and then with my son, her water broke and then she went to the OB office. They checked her and said, oh yeah, your water broke. You should go to the hospital now. And then we drove over yeah. to the hospital. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, it you know, like, yeah, be, it's, yeah. it's a process. So, so big difference between those. So in a normal delivery I've broken broken things down into four steps that you should follow always. All right. Number one is just prep. Make sure that you get you get gowned, you get gloved, you get masked up, um, you get some goggles on. Things could get a little messy, so mm-hmm. just make sure that you're prepared for that. Actually, funny story in the delivery I did a couple months ago. I said, "Hey, everybody, like grab me a gown." And then I looked up, and everybody was wearing gowns and go- goggles except me. Like no one got me my stuff. Like, you were I was the one, the one actually like, doing like, it in the hot zone, right? <laughs> like, and they just, but. Uh, 
you should drape the mother and you should drape a little kind of landing zone for baby, mm-hmm. right? Because he might kind of pop out and then you want something to rest him on so with some blankets. And usually there's OB kits, that commercial OB kits have all this stuff in it, right? So just kind of set things up. I'm going to drape the mother to give her some privacy. I'm going to put, uh, you know, keep her legs spread, but I'm going to put a little landing zone for the baby and make sure that that's clean and, and good. Mm-hmm. Uh, designate. So what we do a lot of times and what, what I found really helpful is designate a partner to hand you stuff. Mm-hmm. So we talk in like hazmat situations, you have a clean medic, dirty medic, or you have a clean tech, dirty tech. Yeah, yeah. So there's one person who's handling the hazardous materials and one person that's handing you the clean tools. Right, right? And right. that way you're never decontaminating the... Same kind not, of thing. You're not contaminating the... Yeah. It's the same thing, right? Yeah, right. It's not right. really hazardous materials, but... Right. You, know, right. you want to be... I would one argue person that should be dealing after, with thir- it. after three children that I, I would designate them as hazardous <laughs> it's materials. It's a hazmat yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you're dealing with uh, someone who's going to be kind of, you know, you know delivering the baby and handling that and then someone who's handling the tools and can get you supplies when you need it so you're just not transferring fluids and things yeah, like that yeah. um then it's it's time to wait and tell the mother to push when she's having contractions right step two is just delivering the head it's very simple the head is going to start one way and end up another way but the head will deliver first mm-hmm. if you're crowning all you're going to do is put gentle pressure on the head mom's going to push and you're just going to kind of make sure that the baby doesn't explode and launch out and slips out of your hands. Don't drop the baby, rule number one. Right. right? And literally, this is what you're doing. You're just gentle pressure. You're not pushing it back in, just gentle pressure on the head and allowing it to come out. So once we've delivered the head, we move on to the torso. And like we said earlier, the, the baby's going to rotate. Uh, he starts face down, and then he's going to rotate. And so he's going to have one shoulder that's kind of pointed down towards the ground and one shoulder that's pointed up towards the sky. Mm-hmm. And he might start kind of like turtling or head bobbing, right, because he's, he's caught. And if he is, no big deal. That's just the smallest portion of the, the opening, right? He, a lot of times they're getting kind of caught on that fastest pubis. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do we do about that? So, yeah. So, I mean, most of the time that top shoulder will deliver fine on its own and then the bottom one and then the rest of the baby will come out. Um, but if you do, like I said, what we can do is put some just gentle pressure is it not? We're not yanking the head or the neck or anything, but just gentle pressure on what's presented so far, downward pressure to get that top shoulder to come off. Down towards the ground. Down yeah. towards the ground, yeah. yeah. If you do have that, like what you're saying, that like kind of like turtling with it, like the head's bobbing in and out, that would be a sign of what we call shoulder dystocia, which means that the shoulders is stuck like you said on, on you know on the bone there so sometimes you might have to do a little bit more pressure or even reach up along that top shoulder to push down on that shoulder again you don't want to put pr- a lot of pressure on the head and neck um, but some gentle pressure down of th- that entire area usually will be enough if you're having trouble then like i said then then, then we move on to other we got other plans things. for what happens when yeah yeah wrong. exactly but, but this most is just normal time and then as the as the as the two shoulders deliver then the baby will start to rotate up we want to make sure we're suctioning as well um sometimes you'll even have time to suction when the just the head presents just the heads out because yeah. sometimes it takes another whole contraction to, to deliver the shoulders so usually one contraction for the head another contraction for the you know for the shoulders and the rest of the body will slip out after that but a lot of times you can suction even when just the head's sticking out yeah um, but you just want to make sure you do suction so that they don't you know aspirate anything and yeah. you have complications down the line yeah so and then we always suction uh mouth first nose second mm-hmm. is what we're told so just remember you have one mouth hole you got two nose holes right one two so Easy way to remember it. Suction the mouth, then the nose. Um, then, so check four now. Step four now, we're in checking the infant, right? Once the torso goes, he's, he's coming out. He or she's coming out. So we're going to suction the mouth and the nose. We're going to clamp and cut the cord. So how far apart, how does that all work? So, I mean, for that, you don't have to worry too much. I mean, there's a lot of research now saying that we even kind of like wait to kind of wait to cl- mm-hmm. cut cut and clamp the cord, excuse me. Um, but basically, they like said, you want to, you know, a couple inches from the, if you're going to, cut and clamp a couple inches from the um from the baby from the baby yeah from the from the uh belly button essentially or what will be the belly button and we're gonna do again two clamps so one you know one closer one farther away and then we're just gonna cut in the middle there i mean it's in the middle pretty straightforward yeah no and there's like like protocols to tell you different things like we were told like one inch apart and then three inches apart and then eight inches from the baby should be your first clamp and that doesn't really matter how far apart like it's just It'll be fine. Honestly, like it'll scientifically, fine. none of it. Yeah, really it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Uh, do expect though that when you cut that cord, there will be some blood left over in that cord. That's not anything bad. There's just there's blood in that cord, yeah. so there'll be some bleeding there. Um, I, I had a delivery one time where I cut, and like everybody was like, I didn't expect it. They didn't expect it. It was like my first time doing it, and we were all just like, "Wow!" Like this is like a volcano of blood from the cord. So well, there's did, a little bit of bleeding. Did you just clamp too far apart? You think yeah, I think just maybe just in the middle. Yeah, there was, was enough yeah. that it kind of gorged out a little right. bit there, but. Uh, um, so yeah, cut and clamp the cord. 
And then we need to evaluate the baby. And how we evaluate the baby is using the APGAR score. Uh, while we're doing this, we want to try to stimulate and warm the baby. You don't, don't shake the baby. Don't do anything like that. Just, you know, touching the baby, touching the bottom of the feet a lot of times is what kind of stimulates a baby. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- keep them warm, right? Keep and, them warm. And a, a, one of the best ways to do this is just immediately put the baby up on mom's chest. I mean, there's yeah. no reason that the, like that that will help stimulate the baby and warm the baby with mom and that sort of thing. So that's that's a you can do the APGAR score while the yeah. baby's on mom there. You don't have to like completely take it away right. somewhere else. And that's another reason why I like have that kind of designated landing zone because now kind of the mess is below, below them. You can kind of wrap them in now in a clean sheet or blanket or whatever mm-hmm. and kind of swaddle them and then hand, hand them to mom. Yeah. And yeah, you can go for the skin to skin contact with just covered in a blanket. If you've got a little hat, you can put a little hat on them. But we want to do want to, it's very important to keep the baby warm yeah. at this period of time. And a lot of times what I'll do is like once the baby's delivered, I'll immediately put them up on mom mm-hmm. and then from there like kind of rub them, you know, rub them down clean them yeah. off then cl- cut and clamp the cord there and then start doing okay. my apgars yeah. all from there so so beyond that we want to do two apgar scores we want to do one right off the bat and then one five minutes later mm-hmm. and the score is going to get better we use apgar apgar that stands for appearance pulse rate grimace activity and respiration so what are we testing? Apgar just basically goes zero one two, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep, zero one two. So their appearance, like if they're blue or pale, that's a zero. And then if their body, because you can get a maximum of ten. Yeah, ten right. is the best. Ten is the max score you can get. Yep. So appearance is zero for blue or pale. If their body's pink but their extremities are blue, they get a one, so halfway, right? right. And if they're completely pink, then they get a two. Yep. Perfect score, right? Pulse rate. If they don't have a pulse, zero. They're a zero. If they have a pulse of less than a hundred, they're a one. If they have a pulse of a greater greater than 100, there are two. Simple mm-hmm. as that. Grimace, if they're not grimacing at all, zero. Zero. If they grimace a little bit, one. If they're actively crying, two. There, nailed it. See, it's a very simple scale. <laughs> um, activity, they're limp. Zero. Zero activity, they get a zero. If there's some movement, one. And if there's much movement, two. Yeah, like it's very subjective. <laughs> 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 like it's kind of funny. And then respirations, they're not breathing. Zero. If they have slow or irregular breathing. One. And then if they are breathing regularly. Two. Two. Perfect. So max so of 10. Now, if you have a the, score of yeah, less ahead. than six, that indicates the need for resuscitation efforts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anytime you have a score of less than six. However, don't panic. It is very normal with just some stimulation for this score to jump up right off the bat. You should expect no baby besides Jesus Christ came out with an APGAR of 10. Do we know that he came out with that? I, I, I think it's documented. It's well documented. <laughs> no, so you're not. You're probably not going to come out with a ten. So don't yeah. panic about that. There's going to be some stuff that makes the baby look a little iffy. And then in five minutes, when you take your next Apgar score, you you should see a pretty major improvement. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I feel like usually the Apgar is like eight and then nine, or like eight and then ten. Yeah. It's usually right. Oh, yeah, I've had it down like, in the seven and six. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then it's like, oh, oh, and then you're like, do we need to resuscitate? And then just by touching the baby and being like, are you okay? It starts moving. Well, say like, resuscitation can be just a little more stimulus, a little yeah. more like rubbing them down with a blanket to get them moving and crying. Right. Uh, obviously, if there's big respiratory issues, we might need to bag them, that sort of thing. But right. yeah, for the most part, like I said, those quote unquote lower scores, as you said, the resuscitation is very easy you know, yes. he's just stimulating the baby a little bit exactly so that is a normal delivery quick review you prep your area you deliver the head by supporting it and you wrap your fingers around the neck to make sure there's not a cord there if there is you try to slip it over if you can't then we're going to talk about what we do now step three you deliver the torso a little p- pressure on the shoulders if he's having trouble getting his shoulders out it's going to explosively deliver <laughs> probably then so make sure you got a good grip on the guy and then you're going to suction mouth then nose Get an APGAR score, stimulate the baby, warm him, clam, cut, cut the cord. and clamp the cord. Okay. Boom. Done. Easy. Easy. Now, what happens when things go wrong? There are only a couple of things that can go wrong. One. And this is the part that people, this, I think this is why people get intimidated by the topic is because of the what could go wrong stuff. So, so again, the, the normal delivery most of the time is going to present, present and occur the way we just described it. In cases where there could be complications, which are rare, but not, not impossible, right? Um, you know what 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 do we need to do and like you said there's just a couple things and some of them aren't a big deal right yeah like our first one breach presentation yeah. a lot of times breach presentation is no big deal you can deliver a baby in breach right it's not that big of a deal so what do we do what is it 
It just means that the butt is presenting first, okay? Mm-hmm. Some people define breach as anything but the head is a breach, but we want to kind of define arm and limb presentation differently. So you see the butt. There's a couple of things that can be happening internally. The baby could be, like, cross-legged. Both legs could be up towards his head. Like, there's a bunch of different things that can go on. Mm-hmm. But bottom line is if you see the butt, we're just going to deliver, but be prepared that you might have issues with not being able to get it out. If you can't get it out, if at any time you can't get the baby out and a a period of time is going, you're going to go ahead and delay delivery and transport rapidly. Okay. I would not expect this to happen very often in just a breach. Breach happens like a lot. Yeah. Like like a high percentage of breach presentation happens. This isn't a big deal. It's just the head's not coming out first. So you're just going to deliver things. It's a little more. The same thing. A little more risky. Yeah. Yeah. Support the butt now. Like as soon as you can get access to the neck, run your hands around the, the neck to see if the cord's there. Just kind of be cognizant of those things. Shouldn't be that big of a deal. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is arm or limb presentation. Very different. Mm-hmm. If there is just an arm or a, a leg coming out of that baby, this is very rare, but it is impossible to deliver that baby. Right. Which means that the mother well, needs a C-section. And especially the arm, right? So if an arm is coming out first, that means that baby's laying essentially transverse. That's not coming out. Yeah, he's laying on his side across the opening. Right. Reaching right? through. Yeah. Right? And that's you, you're not going to be able to deliver that baby. That, that baby needs to be... Like I said, taken out by C-section. Yeah. So what do we do in, in cases where we have complications like that and we, we know that this needs a C-section? Well, it's pretty simple. We're going to do things to delay delivery. Mm-hmm. So we're going to have the mom be panting with con- contractions. She's going to push. To, she's going to try to pant. Don't push. We're going to prop mom's hips up so that gravity's working against the baby, right? Mm-hmm. So the baby's kind of sliding back downhill, if you will. Yeah. And we're going to rapidly transport. And we're going to support the, the mother's ABCs as best we can. And this is where early communication with the hospital is going to be important. Telling yeah. them what you're seeing, talking to them, letting them know what to where, where you're going. Because you might go to – you're probably going to the emergency room. You're not right. probably going to, like, uh, labor and delivery and things like that, depending. Yeah, yeah. So, But they're going to want to probably send – You need to call like a delivery early. doc down to help you out. You, yeah, it's, they're not going to do that in the emergency room. They're going to have to go straight to the operating room. So they're going to pull into the ER – and immediately the hopefully the OB is right then saying, and there. Get the OB and downstairs them, or whatever, and, get and we're going to take them right up to an operating room. So you're going to call in and basically say, "Hey, here are the vital signs. I've got an arm presentation or a foot presentation. Uh, we are supporting mom at this point and trying to delay delivery. And then, yeah, you're just going to transport. And then do what you can with what you got. Right. Simple as that. The other thing that can happen is called a prolapse cord. This gets mixed up a lot of times with what's called a neutral cord. They're different. A prolapse cord is just when the cord comes out first before the baby does. Mm -hmm. So all we see, we go down, look for crowning, all we see is the cord is is hanging out. Um, If there's any part, the presenting part of the baby that's coming out with it, we're going to kind of gently push that baby back in, and we're going to elevate that presenting part. Mm -hmm. Because the, the issue here is that whether it's the head or the butt or the leg or whatever, if it's putting pressure on the cord... It's cutting off his own circulation supply. Mm-hmm. We're not going to be able to deliver right now, so we're going to go ahead and push baby back back in and hold baby up off that cord as best we can. And sometimes there's like techniques you can do two fingers and kind of like spread your fingers and do kind of the Vulcan, you know, hold it up like this. I'm doing it for the camera. I don't know. Why I do. A lot of people are just listening, but anyway, you can kind of like Vulcan hold them up, um, and then you're just going to rapidly transport. Same thing. Try to delay. You know, kick the kick the feet up, and it's not going to be like it can be just like just the cord hanging out. Yeah. Um, but more more likely than not, it's going to be like you're going to see the head, but you're going to see the cord on top of it, and that's yeah. not what we want. That that is that is a prolapsed cord at that point. So we're going to you know push back on that head, elevate it off the cord, and then transport again. That baby cannot deliver. Yeah. In that way, so they're going to need a C-section. So same thing, same things we were doing before. The panting. The, the difference is here now is that we've got our hand on there, and a lot of times the medic may even just keep his hand there all the way up to the operating yeah. room before. And it's you time will to... have to, in, in this instance, you will have to reach up into the vagina a little bit. Like yeah. you, you are going to be inserting your fingers and holding it up because it's yeah. not just like if you just see the cord, you can't just be like, well, nothing's pinching it off. Well, the body's probably pinching it off up higher, right, so you right. do need to try to find baby and hold him off that cord yeah, as best yeah, yeah. possible. Absolutely. And like you said, probably right up to the delivery room, your your, your hands in there. Right, right. Um, then we're going to move on to neutral cord, which is when the cord is wrapped around the baby's neck. Right. A lot of times this isn't that big of a deal. You're just going to go ahead and... Well, nine times out of ten, yeah, nine times out of ten, <laughs> that's going to slip very easily. The only time that I've ever seen neutral cords, when I've seen a ton of them, is that you, you literally just grab the cord and lightly pull it over top of the baby's head. 
Now, if it's stuck, I mean, if it's real tight and you can't, you know, because we shouldn't be yanking pressure, or tugging on it. Yeah. I talk about gentle pressure, right? If we can't, then we're going to we can't leave that there. It's going to strangle the baby. So we need to clamp and cut the cord. So yeah. if only the head and neck have delivered, we're going to have to clamp and cut the cord right there. So we're going to, you know, get two two parts of it, clamp, cut right around the neck to relieve that pressure, deliver the rest of the baby. We're gonna have a real long, probably yeah, umbilical cord. We just can cut and clamp sure it again you, later, but just you know. make sure you cut the right spot. What's that? Don't cut that baby. Cut the cord. Oh well, yeah, I mean, just saying. Don't could scare people. Oh, could you imagine missing? They take off its ear. <laughs> just like you hit a bump or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, they, the even the even the the scissors that we use for that like have a special like. We just have a scalpel in our kit. A scalpel? Yeah. You have, you have to have scissors in your in your OB kit. You do. No, we don't. I promise you, we don't. We we have always used a scalpel to cut the cord. Maybe well, then we need, yeah. Maybe don't. we need to get a better kit. Yeah. Well, then <laughs> we'll yeah. Be, they don't cut the yeah. Baby. I'm just saying, be careful. So, like, basically, clamp two parts, and then pull the cord like way off, and then cut the cord separately. Like, yeah. Don't cut it near the baby's neck. Obviously. I'm just gonna buy you some scissors. It should just be an obvious thing to do. I didn't mean to make this big thing. <laughs> <It's just laughs> a lot. The only other one I would throw in there is shoulder dystocia, and that's why I, I touched on that earlier, where like the shoulders get stuck. Sometimes you need to re- reach up in. To put pressure on that shoulder, it's going to be downward pressure towards downward the ground pressure, to yeah, kind of on that get shoulder the to shoulder kind of get that delivered. Through. There are some other techniques you can use. You can grab that arm, like that arm, and pull it out. I mean, like I don't but, think yeah, we're probably yeah, you're probably not going to do that. Do so that if you, if, if the head delivers and the shoulders just won't come out, and you're putting gentle pressure and the shoulders just don't come out, then that is life threatening to the baby. And again, all you can do is. Support mom, support baby, and get to the hospital as quick as you can. And yeah. call and let us know, hey, I've got a, you know, the, the head is delivered. There seems to be a shoulder dystocia. The shoulders will not deliver. We need, you know, that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. So it, it's a lot simpler than it sounds, okay? If we were, if we have the baby delivered and we want to just know the signs of like when we need to resuscitate, so we'll cover that real quick. Remember an APGAR score of below six, we're going to go ahead and resuscitate. Mm-hmm. Remember that an infant or baby, if they ever have a heart rate below 60, you're doing CPR on that baby. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, if they seem to be in respiratory distress, even if their APGAR is good in other places, but you see that there's apnea or irregular respirations, mm-hmm. then go ahead and, and start resuscitating the baby. And yeah. it might just be airway resuscitation. It doesn't always have to be CPR. Yeah. And if they have poor tone, so they're not responding to their, their limp, they're not responding to their environment well, those can all be, be uh, signs. And when we say resuscitation, we basically mean supporting their breathing, right? BVM, supporting their breathing stimulating them as best we can cpr if their heart rate is Chest absent or below yep. uh 60 and then maintain a warm environment yeah really. that's pretty much it right yeah. we want to warm them up and and that's it we're not going to really be doing any yeah. more advanced techniques here and i'll tell you it is not your call on whether or not that is a miscarriage or that's uh you know honestly your policy until you've been you've had a pronouncement this is a life mm-hmm. until you've had a pronouncement from the hospital because you describe what you have your job is to resuscitate whatever comes out of that mother. Right, yeah. Okay, absolutely. honestly, just resuscitate whatever that comes out of that mother until you have communication with the hospital and you talk them through it. So again, this can be a high stakes, like high stressful thing. But as you can see, I mean, most of the time it's going to go fine. Yeah. It's a very straightforward process on how to del- how to help the baby deliver. And there's a couple things that we can run into that are, you know, can be scary, but there's some very straightforward ways to deal with them. And yeah. again, I think some of it too is maybe even accepting that you can only do as much as you can do with the resources that you have. Yeah. Um, I, I currently work, cover a hospital where we don't have any OB. So if a woman comes in and, and she's in full labor, and I have to deliver the baby myself. I don't have a NICU. I don't have, and I'd have to transport her like a good hour and a half to get there. So I've kind of already, I'm, luckily I haven't had to do it and hopefully yeah. I won't, but I've already kind of accepted that, hey, like, you know, there are risk of poor outcomes and I'm going to do everything I can in my best. And that, that is all I can do. So yeah. again, like I said, I think not getting stressed about the things that you can't do anything about. Right. I, I like well, this yeah. thing. It's manage yeah. your 10%, like 90% of the things in life are out of your control. 10% are in your control. So worry about your 10%, do what you know you need to do. And again, that's the important piece because when you throw everything else out, when you throw out the baby with the bathwater, if you will, Oh, I See what I did that. there? I hated that. No, so you much. hated it. Okay. <laughs> no, but again, like, like where you, like you were even saying, where medics will or or they won't do anything. They won't even check for crowning because heaven forbid, this thing could go. They have to be responsible well, for something. Yeah. Yeah. Like no, 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 no. Like, the, like what we are responsible for is what we're responsible for, and that's pretty straightforward. And there are going to be things that are out of our hands at some point, and and that 
can be unfortunate, but usually that's not the case. And again, communicating with the hospital and things always is, is key uh, to let me, you know, if you don't have it, I probably do, right? So call me ahead of time, say, hey, this is what I got. And uh, like I said, I think we can we can help propagate good outcomes if we're open of that communication and all doing what we know we can do. So Yeah, I think in general, there's two algorithms that you're following. It's either the normal dis- delivery that we already described to you with a couple of little variations. Oh, the shoulder's not coming out, so I'm going to push down on it. Or, oh, his head needs a little help here. Oh, the, I'm going to slip the cord around his neck. Right? This is normal delivery stuff. Right. Or you recognize it as a you know, prolapse cord issue or a arm or limb presentation where this baby's not going to be delivered. So what do I do? Well, I, I kick butt to the hospital and prop, prop mom up and I delay delivery, right? There's yeah, really yeah. only two things that we're doing. We're either delivering the baby or not. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So what to do when you're not going to deliver it, how to recognize that, and what to do when you're going to. Exactly. But beyond that, I think it's pretty simple stuff. And it's yeah. a lot of fun to do. I think that uh, it's a pretty rewarding experience. There's not many times that we show up to a quote-unquote emergency scene and it's a good thing that's happening, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like a yeah. good, important life event that's happening that we get to be a part of. And, you know, cameras are on you, you know, a little bit with it. Remember that this is something that mother is going to remember for the rest of her life. So mm-hmm. do a good job. Be be compassionate. Respect her privacy and her modesty. Do what you can to be comforting, you know. And even if it is an emergency situation where it's, hey, you know, baby's not coming right now. We need to go. And, you know, just be there for that mother because it's, it's going to be a big life event that they're going to remember yeah, for a long time. Absolutely. Cool. Well, hopefully this guys this helps you guys um, kind of, like I said, maybe take away some of the fear and anxiety that can come into to play here. Hopefully we've broken it down in a, a simple, straightforward way. You can review this as a, as an algorithm to follow for, for deliveries. Um, we'll be back next week with another episode. Uh, remember to continue to send in your questions, uh, any questions, comments, concerns that you have, send them in to training at sitesandsirens.com. If you're prepping for your national registry prep, national registry test, whether you're EMT, paramedic, or an educator, check out our prep program at sitesandsirens.com. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking the time to listen and, uh, we will see you again soon. Stay sweet. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're an EMT or medic student or an advanced EMT student or an instructor of those students, we have a program just for you. With Sights and Sirens NREMT prep program, you get video lectures over 15 hours of really vetted, great content to help you through your program and help you prepare for the test. Check it out at www.sightsandsirens.com.